<laughs> several the hadiths the Prophet makes it absolutely clear. Anybody who loves me has no choice but to love my disciples. Anybody who hates them will hate me, and anybody who hates me, of course, is going to hate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and his place is in hell. So, really, loving and respecting the Sahaba is a sign of love of Rasulullah sallallahu And it is also another important point in it is this. It shows us how Allah also appreciates and values ordinary human beings. In that sense, although they are special the Sahaba, but they were human beings who came out of Kufr, many of them, most of them came out of the state of Kufr. And not only of kuf of ordinary kind, but a kuf of an extraordinary kind. A kuf where some of them had committed heinous acts of killing ten of their own children, for instance. Of committing all kinds of evils that we can't even imagine. These were people who were transformed by the company of Muhammad Rasulullah So much so that the Quran praises them. And in one verse, single verse, nine of their beautiful attributes are mentioned. Allah says, "Huwa dalik al fuzul azim, al taibun al abidun al hamidun al saibun al raqibun al sadidun al abidun bil maruf, wa naun anhumka, wa al hafidun al hudud Allah." Nine qualities of these disciples of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are mentioned, and. The verse that I recited from Surah Al-Fatih, the victory, the triumph, in that chapter, the last verse is Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of God. And those who are with him are strong against the disbelievers. And they are caring to each other. This is how the Sahaba are described in the Quran as being strong against the disbelievers. But this point is very important. They are strong, okay? They are not feeble. They are not weak. They cannot be manipulated. They cannot be taken advantage of. They are so powerful that they will not allow any conspiracy theory to thrive amongst them, okay? They are not people who believe in conspiracies, okay? They are people who know how to deal with their enemies. They know how to deal with adversaries. They know how to treat their opponent. And amongst themselves, they are very caring. But it's the next part I wanted to talk us on where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outlines another set of qualities of these people. Allah says, they are mentioned in the Torah as well. And what do you see in them? They are they are strong, firm, and they're also caring amongst themselves. These are moral characteristics, okay? This is social life. But as far as their spiritual life is concerned, as far as their devotion is concerned, as far as their link and connection with Allah is concerned, how is that? You will see them often bowing, prostrating, spending their time in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, constantly seeking His pleasure, good pleasure and trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah then goes on to, the Quran goes on to describe them. It's saying that, you know, their picture, their picture in the Torah and in the Gospels is like this. And it's very interesting. That the Quran paints of them. It doesn't paint it itself, but it says in the previous books, in the book of Moses, in, in the book of Moses, and in the Gospels, it is described like this. Okay? But before we go to that, it says, when you look at them, their faces show those signs of beauty, of devotion. You can tell that from their faces. One reading of this is that because they constantly prostrate and you can see a mark on their foreheads of, of that. But the best reading is really that you see their faces 
And you can tell people from their faces. The gloomy, the miserable, the wretched, you can tell them. And those who are joyous, those who are happy, those who are true servants, those who love others, love and joy comes from their faces. That is the reality that the Quran says, you know, you'll recognize from the goodness of their faces. And how they're described in the in the Torah, in the in, in the Gospels, and how they're described in the book of Moses. Allah goes on to tell us. It is like this. It is like a seed that is planted. And that seed then grows. It, its stem comes out, shoots come out, and the stem gets stronger and stronger until it is able to stand on its own foot, on its by itself, and be able to bear fruits. And then and the sower is amazed and pleased by it. And it is also the Yahiza Bihimul Kufar. And as a result, the Kufar, the disbelievers, are enraged by this. And you know, when we look at the Sahaba, the followers and the companions of Muhammad, they started weak, very weak, so weak that. They couldn't stand up for themselves. They were beaten. For 13 years, they were constantly beaten. Not only beaten, you know, with sticks, but sometimes killed. As we know, Yasir and Sumayyar and many other the disciples who were murdered in Makkah. But Rasulullah told them, you just have to be patient. Well, you cannot stand up against them. There is no way that if you were to fight, if you were to make a physical struggle, we could withstand this, we would be wiped out. This is not the strategy. For 13 years, the Muslims were under huge tension, under huge, uh, you can say, pain and sufferings. And it is that, you know, it's like the seed which you plant, you don't see it for quite a while. It goes under the, under the soil, it's disappeared, it's gone, it's absent. We don't see anything happening, and of course there is a lot happening, isn't there? The seed under the soil is actually growing, it is living, it is energizing, it is getting the energy that will make it shoot out and then grow and bear fruit. And that is what happened for 13 years in Makkah. And I wish our Muslim leaders would also learn to strengthen themselves, strengthen their communities, strengthen their own countries so that they can then fight the enemies. And that is really crucial. If you are not strong enough, you will never be able to withstand the evil and the injustice around you. And this is a constant battle that a believer has to do. He has to stand up against evil. Today, we have given up standing up against evil. Instead, we look at superficial things and we look at, in a naive way, we look at conspiracy theories rather than really being strong and tackling the root problem. The root problem being we Muslims are weak at this moment. All over the world. And the only solution to the wretchedness and the problems that we have is one. And that is to become strong. That is to become a shidda. Strong and wa'aidu lahum masqatatu min quwwatin lum ibadu khayn as the Quran says. Be always prepared and strong and ready to face the enemy. Who is ready to face his enemy? And we see that sadly there aren't any Muslim country who is able to face its enemy. It just, just does not happen. Not only I'm talking about it militarily, but in other ways as well. Today, a war is waged in a different way. A, way, a war is waged through the, through the internet. The way the war is waged through films, the Hollywoods and the Bollywoods. The way Bollywood is having an impact on Pakistanis, for example, Pakistani Muslims, is amazing and it's shocking, you know, to see that. The way this cultural onslaught and the way that materialism and consumerism is getting into our heads, into our rooms, is a different way. That's a war in itself. And we must not underestimate the the power of that war, because that war is the most dangerous one. More dangerous than the military wars, to be honest. It's far more dangerous because it is changing our mentality. It is making us materialistic. It is taking away from us our faith as well. How are we to guard ourselves against that? How are we to face those onslaughts? Here, 
the Quran tells us how the Sahaba were, you know, they were growing inside. Their faith was developing until they became strong. So strong that the Kuffar around them were enraged, furious. Not only the the Makkah, the, the, the Quraysh and the Kuffar of Makkah were enraged, but the, the Persian Empire and the Persian Emperor, and so was the Roman Emperor, so enraged and furious that how could this little, these, these uncouth, uncivilized Arabs be a power that can look us in the eye? That was because Muhammad Rasulullah was leading them, and they were the companions and the friends of Muhammad Rasulullah. As I said, this is this the in the Gospels, you know the the story that Isa Islam tells of the sowers, the, the, you know the parable of the sowers, you know those people who plant the seed. It's exactly like this the way the Quran tells it. But the Quran goes a bit further, and of course it's also mentioned in as I said in in, in the book of Moses as well. I hope you can see something. Rasulullah never studied the Gospels or the Old Testament. It was not available to him. So this is a very beautiful part of the, of the revelation that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, it added a value to the story in the Gospels as well. Anyway, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the Sahaba, the, the, the followers of Rasulullah as people who grew strong, so strong, that they were able to make a transformation, a change in society. I would have loved to talk about these great human beings, these great role models for us, but we don't have much time. Just mention that Rasulullah was very proud of his disciples and his followers and his friends around him. So proud that he would give them titles. Some he gave the title of Siddiq, the most truthful. Others he gave the title of al faru the one who is a criterion of truth and and, 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 uh, and uh, righteousness and uh, goodness. The others he gave the title of al ghali the most charitable, the most gracious, the most generous. The others he gave the title of Asadullah, of Saifullah, the Lion of God, the Sword of God, and so on. This is how he blessed them, and they in turn were changed, they were transformed. Let me just give you two examples before I finish. This is the time of when Umar is ruling the Muslim world. He is the Khalifa, he is the ruler of the Muslims. And a Coptic from Egypt comes to him and lodges a complaint. Obviously he's a, somebody who is well educated and is a Coptic Christian. He comes to the, the ruler of the Muslims in Medina and says that the son of your governor son of your governor, Muhammad bin Amr, has unfairly and unjustly whipped me and has you know, taken advantage of me. I, wish I couldn't get justice in Egypt and I've come to complain to you that your governor is not doing justice. The history books report that Umar immediately wrote to Amr bin al as who was the governor of Egypt, to come with his son Muhammad bin Amr al as and bring him. When he came there, a court was set up and the Coptic stood on one side, Muhammad bin Amr bin al as the son of the governor, stood on the other side. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala listened and finally decided and made it absolutely clear that what Muhammad bin Amr bin al as had done was unjust, unfair. So he gave the Coptic the whip and said, you whip him as he whipped you. The Coptic took the whip, but he did not whip him. He said, I wanted to see this justice done. I wanted to show that Muslims will treat others with justice as well. It is the same rumor when there is famine in Medina. And he's very worried. There is famine, drought. There isn't enough food around. People are starving. Umar is worried. And he hears the good news that Osman bin Affan of the Allahu An, the great generous person who's called Al Ghani by the Prophet, a large caravan of his camels is coming, laden with graves. So Umar is excited. He says, Well, at last, you know, we're going to relieve the Muslims of the misery they're facing. So 
As soon as the caravan arrives, Umar rushes to Usman and says, I want to buy this for the treasury. And how will you sell it? I'm willing to give you 50% profit. Usman says, no thank you. You know, this is a day that I can make money. There are people here who, are, who will give me what I ask for. And they say, this is not good enough, Umar. Umar says, I will give you 75% profit. That is as far as I can go. And Osman says, no. Umar is shocked. Umar is wondering, what has happened to this man who the Prophet gave the title of al ghani the charitable, the generous? What has happened to him within 10 years? He has changed. He's the one who is Sunnu who has who married two daughters of the Prophet <coughs> What has happened to this man who was al ghani in the time of the Prophet? In <coughs> 10 years he has changed so much. Umar goes back shocked. He goes back home and he's shocked. That how can this have happened? He's wondering, he's criticizing Osman. He lies down and short while later he hears somebody making an announcement. And he summons his secretary and asks him, go and find out what's happening out there. His secretary comes back and tells that Osman is now distributing his grades. Omar is really shocked and amazed what is happening here. I offered him 75% profit and he was telling me that today is the day that he can get huge profits on his grades. When he comes to Osman, he sees Osman busy distributing his grades, free of charge, not charging a penny to anybody. Rich and poor who comes to him, he's just giving his grades out. Omar is amazed and surprised. He says, Osman, I was giving you 75% profit. You said you could make a lot of money today. And Osman says, yes, that is true. I have made a contract with him who is going to give me at least 700 times more. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers, this is the transformation that Muhammad Rasulullah saw about. That his company made. These are the friends of Muhammad Rasulullah. And as Christ very beautifully said, you recognize people from the company they keep, from the people who are around them. And this is a very beautiful example of the transformation that the sohba, the presence of Rasulullah did to people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us love of these great men, of these great men of uh, Prophet's friends, who for us, as the Prophet said, as Sahabi my Sahaba are like the stars. Whichever of them you follow, you will be guided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to follow these wonderful people.